Hello, my name is Chris Garcia, and I'm one of the elders at New Life in Christ Church. We are currently going through, in our Spring 2020 Sunday School class, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, the Apostles' Creed is an early church creed. And church creeds are very important for us because what they do is they take the teachings of Scripture and they summarize, they summarize and systematize them. And so this week we're going to be picking up where we left off. Last week we're, in, we're going to be in week 7 this week uh, of the Apostles' Creed. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my... Uh, a computer screen and we'll go ahead and pick up there so as I said week seven we're gonna be looking this week at the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church so as we look at the Creed and go ahead and move to it I'm gonna go ahead and read the whole Creed again it's very short and the sections that we're gonna be looking at and covering today are gonna to be those that we see in blue here but I'm gonna read the whole Creed it says this I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only begotten Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So this is the creed in its entirety. Uh, last week we talked about uh, Jesus you know, rising again from the dead on the third day, ascending into heaven, and sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and then coming, returning to judge the living and the dead. This week we're going to be focusing on the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, looking at the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. So as we recap from last week, there's a couple of key points just to mention. First, we talked about Jesus, the Jesus he rose from the dead, and what his resurrection meant. And we saw that his resurrection vindicates his claims as the Messiah, Son of God, and it confirms the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice, ensuring our justification. Uh, we talked about Jesus ascending to the right hand of the Father, and we saw that Jesus ascended to the Father's right hand, basically having completed the work of atonement and sits there now, as the king who reigns in heaven and as our advocate before the Father. And we also talked about Jesus coming again. Jesus is going to come again to judge the living and the dead. And we know that there's going to be a final judgment coming, where, in Jesus' own words, he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. And this is going to lead to two separate eternal destinies. So, as we look, you know, we look at these uh, different things last week, these important points here, uh, we move right into this next line which is of the Creed, which is, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, this is following a progression, a logical progression here. And so we just looked at Jesus um, ascending into heaven, now being seated at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus' parting promise to his disciples as he was leaving this world was this. He promised the Holy Spirit. And we see this in a number of places. For instance, in John 14, 16 through 17, he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so in, in, interestingly, you know, we see that the Holy Spirit here is referred as the, to as the Spirit of truth. We see he's referred to as a helper. And this is Jesus' promise before he ascends to the Father, that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And then we also see this in Luke 24, 49. He says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So, again, in this case here, we see Jesus kind of hinting or alluding that the Holy Spirit is going to give a certain power to the disciples. And so the question is this. We, we need to look at this and, and explore this question. Who is the Holy Spirit? And we're going to see that there's a couple of important points. You know, if I'm going to look at four points here. The first is that the Holy Spirit is a person. The second is that he brings forth, forth the word of God. The third is that he is the spirit of truth who testifies concerning Jesus and brings this testimony to life inside of us. And then fourth, we're going to see that he seals and sanctifies believers. So one of the first points I want to look at here is that the Holy Spirit is a person. So he's a person not a force or some kind of energy from God. And so, you know, we see this actually all over Scripture, and just about every reference in Scripture is 
Uh, when it talks about the Holy Spirit, we see him referred to as a person. So here's an example from Romans 8, 26 through 27. Paul says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So as we look at this here, we see a number of points in this here that, 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 that are very clearly about a person that couldn't really mean anything else other than a person. You know, we see the Spirit interceding for us, you know, with groanings that are too deep for words. You know, of course, you know, this is not something that an impersonal force or energy does. You know, interestingly, you know, we see that the Spirit has a mind. You know, we tend to think of mind, body, spirit, you know, separate entities. But, you know, here we see Paul saying that the Spirit has a mind. And the Spirit intercedes for saints using his mind according to the will of God. Okay, so we see that the Holy Spirit is a person. Another important point to make is this, that the Holy Spirit is God. And uh, Orthodox Christian theology has always been unapologetically, unapologetically Trinitarian. Uh, and we see, you know, as we look at the scriptures and we see, you know, what it says about God, when we put those pieces together, what we arrive at is the doctrine of the Trinity here. So we see, for instance, Jesus says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then a separate account where, you know, the account of Ananias and Sapphira, which is where they basically lied to the apostles about selling a plot of land and how much money they were giving. Peter says this, he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. And Peter goes on to say, you have not lied to man, but to God. So clearly the Holy Spirit is God. In fact, he's the third person of the Trinity. And over here on the right, you can see the, this is called the shield of the Trinity. This is a diagram that came out of the Athanasian Creed, which is another another creed which really articulates uh, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. And we see here that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Father is not the Son. They're, they're three distinct persons, but they're one unity, one triunity. And this is the form that God exists in. And this is, you know, this, this is what we arrive at when we take Scripture seriously, when we put all the pieces of Scripture together. And this is what Orthodox Christianity has always affirmed. Okay, so another important point is that the Holy Spirit brings forth the Word. The scriptures that we have were inspired by God. They were breathed by the Holy Spirit. He spoke through the prophets and the apostles here. So we see in 1 Peter 1.21, he says this. He says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. He inspired the prophets. When we look in the Old Testament, you know, we see all over, you know, that the Spirit of the Lord was behind the prophets. For instance, in 2 Samuel 23, 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. Or in Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. So we see that inspiration for the prophets to speak and the message that the prophets gave, which were recorded in the scriptures, came from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit breathed the scriptures. The Holy Spirit, in the same way, brought forth Jesus, who is, in the scriptures, God's living word, his eternal living word. We see in John 1.1, 1, 1, we see, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so Jesus, the Son of God, is described as the word of God. And we see, and we actually looked at this earlier, in, in an earlier part of the Creed, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And in Matthew 1, 20 through 21, the angel speaking to Joseph says this. He says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So another important point on who the Holy Spirit is and what he does, the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. And so he's called the Spirit of Truth, and he gives understanding of who Jesus is. He bears witness to who Jesus is, and he empowers the proclamation of the gospel. And we see Jesus really talk you know, quite at length about the Holy Spirit to his disciples. They don't quite understand what he's talking about while he's talking to it, but after the fact, 
it makes perfect sense to them. So a couple of passages here, as we look in, in the scriptures here, we see in John 15, 26 through 27, Jesus says this, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. So Jesus calls him the Helper. He helps us. And he's sent from the Father. And Jesus says he's the Spirit of truth. He bears witness to the truth. And what does he testify? He testifies about Jesus. He, te he will testify about me, Jesus says. And he tells his disciples that you will testify also because you've been with me from the, the, from the beginning. So we see here the Holy Spirit is going to help the disciples testify about who Jesus is. We see a little bit more in a couple, a little bit later in John 16, 13 through 15, Jesus says this, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And so we see the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into the truth. He's going to be our guide to the truth, our helper. And we see here, you know, he's not going to speak on his own initiative, but he's going to speak what he hears. He's going to glorify Jesus. And we see this, you know, very pointedly just a little bit later in time, before Jesus, you know, at, at his trial, for instance, Peter denies Jesus three times. You know, Jesus spoke to them about, to his disciples about his death. They didn't really understand it at all, what he was talking about while he was here on earth. But then, you know, at Pentecost, all of a sudden we see an enormous change. And we see this here, we see, and they were filled, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. This is in Acts 2, 4. And then just a little bit later in verses 22 through 23, Peter is saying these kinds of things. He says, This Jesus God raised up, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this, which you both see and hear. And so, you know, maybe we're inclined to, to look at the Holy Spirit here and see the, the miraculous speaking in other languages that he was empowering the disciples to do. But you can see what, what is the end? Why is he doing that? We can see it's empowering Peter to preach the gospel, to preach about Jesus, that God raised him up again and, and, and to testify of the witness of, of who Jesus is here. So we see the Spirit giving them this power. The Spirit testifies of Jesus. So what does it mean, then, for somebody to be full of the Holy Spirit? You know, maybe we think of somebody working wonders or, you know, speaking in tongues or, you know, showing some kinds of extraordinary signs and wonders. You can see here, though, what, but what it means is this. You know, it, it means that they love Jesus. They see who he is. They see Jesus for who he really is. And, you know, they speak about him. They testify about him. You know, that, that bearing witness of Jesus, this is... This is evidence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, as we you know, look at the Holy Spirit testifying of Jesus, a very important thing that we have to see here is, you know, apart from just, or maybe in addition to just the testifying, what is the, what is the purpose of testifying? Well, the Holy Spirit gives spiritual life through the testimony of Jesus. If we look here in John chapter 3, Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus, one of the rulers. And Jesus, you know, we see this conversation happen. Jesus says this, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit, of the Spirit, is spirit. So we see a distinction here. You know, we see that clearly Christians, you know, clearly those who belong to Jesus, those who enter the kingdom of heaven, I should say, you know, according to the text, they have something that others don't. You know, so whatever is born of the flesh, that doesn't qualify, right? It has to be born of the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, right? And that makes sense. What's born of flesh is just flesh. What's born of the spirit is going to be spirit. So what does this mean, though? You know, this doesn't really tell us what that actually means. We're going to see here what this means. So one of the things that I want to say is that Christians have a supernatural sight and apprehension of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3-6, through 6, we see this. Paul writes this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may, might not see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as, bond, as your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So we see here that you know, there's a difference between those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Those who are perishing cannot see this glory. They cannot see this light. But you can see here that God shines the light of the gospel in our hearts. You know, he shines the light in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So something that just, you know, that some, two things, let me just say, that, that we just cannot do by force of will. These are just simply not acts of the will. The first thing that we can't do by willpower is we just can't believe something that we don't. You cannot force yourself to believe. Believing is not an act of the will. In a similar way, we cannot find something beautiful that we just don't. You know, we just, we can't force ourselves. You know, we can try to will it. You know, we can stomach it maybe, but do we love it? You know, that ability to see Jesus for who he really is. This comes from the Holy Spirit. So, again, answering this question, what does it mean to be born of the Holy Spirit? You know, we see this here in 1 John, which is written by the same author as the Gospel of John. We see this here. You see, he tells us right here in verse 5, in chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So we see the Holy Spirit empowers us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And we see very clearly, you know, as we talked about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said he would testify about me. We see this very clearly in, in verse 10, 5, uh, 10. He says, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And the testimony that God has given is us, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So that testimony, do we have the Holy Spirit's testimony? Well, do we believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do we find him beautiful? Do we see what he's done on the cross for us? That God raised him from the dead? Are we able to believe him? This is, this is what it means to be born again. Everything else you know, the sanctification and the, the, the new obedience that happens, that all flows from this apprehension of who Jesus is, and this only comes by the Holy Spirit. Okay, we see also that the Holy Spirit seals and sanctifies believers. So all true Christians are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So we see the Apostle Paul write this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. He says, In him... You also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the, redemp to re the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So having the Holy Spirit is a sign that you belong to God. And again, how do you know that you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have faith in who Christ is? Do you have the biblical faith? You know, we also see... You know, Paul tells us in Romans 8, 9, that without the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. So ha being a Christian, belonging to Christ, and having the Holy Spirit, these always come together. You could say that they're logical equivalent in the sense that one always implies the other. Paul says this, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So again, you know, if you're... If you belong to Christ, you have the Spirit. If you don't have, if you don't belong to Christ, if you don't have the Spirit, I should say, you don't belong to Christ, right? So if you have the Spirit, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. And we see here that the Spirit, you know, in addition to testifying to who Christ is, he sanctifies us, he makes us holy, and he intercedes on behalf of believers in Christ. So in Romans 8, 27, it says this, And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. What is the mind of the Spirit? Let me read that again. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So we see the Spirit steps in, the Spirit helps us, the Spirit, you know, intercedes on our behalf, you know, in, in accordance to the, you know, with the will of God. What is the will of God? Well, Paul tells us this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 7. He says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So one of the natural outworkings of being a Christian is that we simply cannot just 
live the way we used to before we knew Christ. You know, we, we, you know, the purpose of God saving us is to make us conform to the image of his son. And so the Holy Spirit leads us in the sanctification. He intercedes for us according to the will of God, which is our sanctification. And, you know, we see here that, that this is the will of God. And we see, you know, what it means to be led by the, by the Spirit. You know, Paul tells us in Romans 8, 13 through 14, he says, For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So being led by the Spirit, you know, as we believe in Christ, we know that he came to save us from our sins. So we're not, we're at war with our sins now. We hate our sins. The Spirit of God is leading us to put those sins to death. And so the, the Spirit empowers this, gives us this new power, this, this new willingness to fight sin inside of us here. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, instantly that we live perfectly holy lives in every sense. But there's a change that the Holy Spirit produces because we love Jesus, because we see that he died for our sins. So we see the Holy Spirit testifies to who Christ is, and the Holy Spirit seals and sanctifies believers. Okay, so the next line in the creed, you know, so we've just seen who the Holy Spirit is. It's not a coincidence. It's a very logical progression that we go from the Holy Spirit to the Holy Catholic Church. Now, this term Catholic, this often, you know, when we hear this, maybe our first inclination is to think of, for instance, the, the Roman Catholic Church. The term Catholic, though, what that really means is universal here. The Holy Catholic Church is the universal church consisting of all who hold to the faith delivered by the apostles. So one of the most important things that we can say about who, you know, as we say, what is the Holy Catholic Church? The true Holy Catholic Church recognizes the authority of the, apostle, of the apostles, and they faithfully hold to the teaching of the apostles here. So we see this here, for instance, when Peter is talking to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. He says, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. So clearly, you know, we see that the apostles had a special commission from Jesus to go preach about who he is. You know, and, and it's imperative that we listen to the apostles. If we want to be the church of God, it's imperative that we listen to the apostles, that we don't invent doctrines of our own. You know, but that we teach, we faithfully teach the teachings that the apostles handed down to us. You know, we see this in John's letter in, in 1 John 4, 6. John says this, We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, if you're from God, you're going to listen to the teachings of the apostles. You know, the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write the, you know, the things that they wrote about Jesus in the New Testament. He inspired the prophets to testify before Christ's coming of who, you know, of the coming Messiah. And so, we're, you know, we have to listen. You know, the, the church, the true church is going to be the church that listens to the apostles. So this faith of the apostles, the apostolic faith, what is this apostolic faith? And what, you know, what is this authority of the church here? So one of the, you know, as we look at this here, the founding of the church, you know, the, the, it's important to realize that the church is founded on a confession, you know, specifically the confession of Christ. And the church is given authority by Christ to adjudicate. So in Matthew chapter 16, you know, we, we find this very important passage about the church and its relationship to Christ. You know, we see, you know, uh, Jesus was questioning his disciples here. You know, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And then Jesus says, you know, they, they, they report to him various things, you know, John the Baptist or Elijah. But Jesus says, you know, in verse starting in, in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 15, he says this. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth 
shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Okay, so this is a really, really powerful passage here. You know, we see Peter giving his confession. Who is Jesus? You know, Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus goes on to tell him, first of all, that flesh and blood did not reveal this to him, but the, but Jesus' Father who is in heaven revealed this truth to him. So Simon Peter didn't just, you know, through his own intelligence perceive this, but this was revealed to him by God. And this is the point where Jesus gives Peter the new name. Simon was his original name, but he says, you, you know, I say to you, you are Peter. You know, in other words, that, that's, you know, tied to the word rock. And, he, you know, he upon this rock, I will build my church. You know, the, the rock here, you know, the, the, the reason Peter is being renamed Peter is because the, the bedrock of his confession, you are the Christ, son of the living God here. It's upon this confession here that, that, that Jesus builds his church. And the gates of hell are not going to overpower this. We also see here, you know, Jesus tells Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So, you know, the church is built on this confession of Christ as the Son of God, as the, uh, you know, as the Messiah, the Son of, of the living God. And the church has authority given to it by, by God to, to adjudicate. You know, we see here it has the power, you know, in the you know, according to the will of God to, to you know, bind things or loose things, to forgive sin or to, you know, or to, to not forgive sin. Of course, it ha you know, it, it's, it's not a carte blanche, whatever you do is just going to be the will of God. But, you know, the church has the responsibility to implement the will of God. But we can see here that Jesus gives authority to the church. So the church is built on this confession of who Jesus is. I want to also point out very importantly, you know, that this confession that establishes the church is the very same confession that saves people. In Romans 10, 9 through 10, Paul writes this. He writes, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation here. So that confession of Jesus is Lord, that, that word Lord is the, the Greek word Kyrios, you know, which which means master. So it's a, it's an acknowledgement of the authority of Jesus and an acknowledgement, you know, that that he is from God and that he demands our obedience, that he's worthy of our obedience. You know, so it's not just an intellectual assent, but it's a it's a willing submission. When you confess something as Lord, it's also it entails a willing submission. But also, you know, it's not just words. It's the belief, you know, the words alone are not, you know, without the belief, are not sufficient here. But there's the believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which, again, as we saw last week, that is the testimony. That is the vindication that he really is who he says he is. And one of the things, you know, we just saw a second ago, we looked at the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. A, you know, as I said, it's not by coincidence those two come in this order. They're linked. This very confession can only be made by the Holy Spirit. So in the in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 Paul writes this he writes therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of God says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is lord except by the holy spirit Now obviously you know I I remember once reading John Piper discussing this passage and he said a computer program could be pro, you know could could easily spit out Jesus is lord you know so you know, he's not saying that you can't mouth these words. You know, Jesus has obviously given a, a, a scary warning in Matthew 7 that, you know, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons, do many wonders and say, I, I'll say to them, you know, I never knew you, depart from me. So it's, you know, it's, it's not just in the words, but, you know, John Piper points out, you know, it's, you know, no one can truly say Jesus is Lord and mean it. Again, we just looked a little while ago at that passage from 2 Corinthians that God is, shine the light of the gospel in our hearts. You know, that ability to see Jesus for who he really is and sincerely confess him as Lord and that desire to submit to him and obey him. You know, that can only come about by the Holy Spirit. You can see here that the Holy Spirit founded the church on the confession of Christ, which is the very same confession that saves us. Okay, so the next line of the creed is the communion of saints. You know, really the, the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints are very, very 
tightly linked. They're, they're really parts of each other. They're different, different sides of the same phenomena of the church here. And, you know, as we, as we look at this line of the creed, one of the first things we really have to ask ourselves is this, who are saints? And maybe if you use that term saints, maybe if you think about it, it conjures up images of, you know, maybe people like Mother Teresa or people who lived long ago, who were, who lived extremely pious and devout lives. Uh, you know, maybe you think of, you know, the, the, the canonization of saints in the Catholic Church, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church. So, the biblical definition of saints is actually quite a bit different from that. Maybe not quite a bit, but it is different from that. You know, and I want to, you know, to kind of get a sense for what we mean by saints, I want to look at a couple of passages here from 1 Corinthians. So Paul often opens his letters to different churches, you know, addressing the, the uh, saints here. So we, we see this here in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 2 through 3. It says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we see some words in here, right? We see, and we see, you know, some context here. You know, he, first of all, you know, Paul is addressing, you know, those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. You know, who is he writing to? He's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth here. And, you know, we can see what characterizes them with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So when Paul talks about saints, these are the people who he's talking about. He's talking about the people who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You know, so when we talk about this here, there, you know, there's the word saints and there's the word sanctified, you know, and, and, uh, you know, this word, you know, if we look at the original language in the Greek, the, the word sanctified is the word hagiazo. And what that means is that means separated from profane things and dedicated to God or purified. And this term saints, just like in English, you know, saints is kind of linked to sanctified. You know, the, the Greek word saints here is hagios. It means a most holy thing or a saint. And so, you know, we might think of, you know, canonized saints of old, you know, who go through this special process, who are recognized, you know, and, and, you know, some churches, you know, by, you know, with special, having a special place here. But we can see here, you know, the, the, and the, the way Paul addresses the church, he speaks to the church as saints. And if we, you know, we consider what we've seen already, you know, that Christ died for us who believe in him to, to, to remove our sins, to purify us. We see that we've been given the Holy Spirit of God. You know, we can see here that all who belong to Christ who've been cleansed of their sins and given the Holy Spirit, these are saints. And so in, in the biblical sense of the word, the saints are the people who belong to Christ. Everyone who belongs to Christ has the Holy Spirit. They've been set apart. They belong to him and they do not belong to the world now. And saints, you know, the church is made up of saints. Saints are what make up the church here. So when we talk about the communion of saints, what we're talking about is the communion of those who have turned to Christ, who have confessed Christ as their Lord, and follow him. Okay, so, you know, maybe as we look at this, you know, the, and if we only leave it at what we've seen so far, this could be a very abstract kind of thing, you know, maybe a disconnected group that maybe doesn't know each other, doesn't have anything in common with each other, except that they have the same belief in Jesus and they're trying to follow him. But maybe they're doing that on their own, you know, completely dispersed, you know, that's not at all, you know, what is entailed by the communion of saints. That's not at all what the church is or what it looks like. You know, the church is actually the visible body of Christ that demonstrates the reality of the love of Christ to the world through communion together. This is what we mean by communion of the saints. And, you know, we see this, for instance, you know, we see, you know, what Jesus intended for the church, you know, uh, in the scriptures. For instance, in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he writes this, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So obviously, you know, Jesus doesn't just intend for us to have faith in him and love him, but just kind of have nothing to do with one another. No, it's quite the opposite of that. He, he commands us to love each other and to care for each other. And he says specifically, this is going to be the evidence that you belong to him. 
this is going to be the evidence that shows the world that he's true and, and that, that, that we, you know, the world knows who belongs to Christ. It's going to be by their love of each other. You know, Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, as he was about to leave the world, he prays for, the, for his people. And, and in verses 20 through 21, he, we see him praying to the Father, asking this. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, meaning his specific disciples, but, also, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's us. That's, you know, those of us who hear the words of the disciples, the apostles, and believe in Christ. These, you know, we're the ones that Jesus has prayed for. And what does he pray? He prays that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. They also may be in us. The world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus is praying that the church has a unity, that we care for one another, that we're united in our faith, and, you know, that we're one. You know, as an evidence, you know, that we know him, that we truly believe in Christ, you know, that, that, that we have sincere faith. You know, one of the evidences that we're given in First John, for instance, is just this. Do we love fellow believers? You know, First John, in, in First John 3, 17, John writes this. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. So we see here, you know, what, what is, you know, what does real love look like? You know, obviously it's not just words, but it's actions, you know, and, and it's, in many cases, it's sacrifice. You know, Christ said, you know, that even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many, to serve and to sacrifice. And this is what biblical love look like, looks like. This is a sacrifice. And this is the kind of love that Jesus said, you know, is going to convince the world, you know, that we're of him and that his love is real. Okay, along those same lines, you know, as we see the, you know, the, the church, the communion of saints, it's, it's important for us to realize, you know, the church is composed, the church is the body of Christ, and it's composed of diverse yet interdependent members here. So even though, you know, within the church we might find a great deal of diversity, you know, we are one on our confession of Jesus as Lord, on, on the apostolic faith, you know, it, Yet we have different gifts, we have different abilities, different skills, and these are not just coincidental, but these were designed by God, and we each bring gifts. You know, we need the church, and we can, you know, we, the church needs our gifts. You know, the church gives us a place where we can both be edified, and we can edify others with the gifts that God's given us here. So in 1 Corinthians 12, you know, Paul speaks at length of this. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, I'm going to read some selected verses from this. So in, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12, Paul writes this, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were made to drink we were all made to drink of one spirit. So we can see, regardless of our nationality, our background, regardless of our different anything that we that, you know, whatever we had before we came to Christ, when we come to him, we're one. And we've all drank, in, you know, of, of, of the same spirit, the Holy Spirit. We've all been baptized into one body, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our social status, regardless of our abilities. We see that Paul goes on to say this in verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye. I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Again, so, you know, you know the, the passages that follow, Paul goes into the different gifts that people have, how the Holy Spirit, you know, gives different gifts to different members in the church, but, you know, yet, you know, having one gift or another, you know, doesn't make anybody more or less important in the church or more or less necessary. In the church, we can see here, you know, Paul talks about you know, the foot saying to the hand, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a hand, so I'm not a part of the body, you know, and you know the, the you know the eye, I'm you know, the ear says I'm not an eye, so I'm not a part of the body, you know, and he goes on to say, if the, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Right. So we all have different gifts that God has given us, and He gives them gives us these gifts specifically for the purpose of edifying one another. 
you know, so it's an interdependent system. You know, if you if you lose a body part, that's a terrible thing. If you you know, you might think, oh, I could live without a hand just fine, right? But just you know, I, I, you know, just imagine if your hand actually cut you know got cut off, for instance. Imagine all the things that you do. You know, take a step back and think about all the things that you do with that hand, and just think about how radically different your life would be if you had to lose that hand. And so you can see all the different parts of the body contribute something. It's an interdependent system. You know, we need the body. The hand needs the rest of the body, and the, and the body needs the hand. And so Paul goes on to say this, you know, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So each each individual human who's in Christ, each believer in Christ, is a member of Christ's body. And together, you know, we compose the body of Christ you know, guided by the Holy Spirit and love for one another, we use our gifts to edify. We sacrifice for each other, we see here. And so, you know, this is very important. You know, you know, the church is critical for every Christian. Every believer in Christ needs to be connected to the church. You need your brothers and sisters in the, in the church. You are not sufficient on your own. And they need you. You have gifts that God has given you to contribute to the edification of the body. Okay, so on this note, are you know, can we just be Christians apart from the church? Does it suffice to say, you know, I've accepted Jesus as Lord and, and Savior and I follow him and, you know, that that's all I need to do. I'm saved, right? You know, can, can we really be Christians apart from the church? You know, I think, you know, this is a very American evangelical kind of way of thinking, but unfortunately this is tragically mistaken. You know, this is a this is a, a great grief, you know, that this belief is so widespread, you know, among professing Christians here in America, and probably in other parts of the world too. You know, let me just mention a couple of quotes from from a couple of great believers of past. You know, Augustine says this. He says, "Whoever is without the church will not be reckoned among the sons, and whoever does not want to have the church as mother will not have God as father." Similarly, John Calvin says this: "Beyond the pale of the church, no forgiveness. Beyond the pale of the church, no forgiveness of sins, no salvation can be hoped for." Okay, so what do the what does this mean? You know, does this mean that you know that, that there's more to it than what Christ has done? That we you know joining the church is another thing that we have to do? Well, not exactly. But what we see here, you know, if we if we kind of think about the things that we've seen, the Holy Spirit, you know, the confession of Christ. And Spirit's work in us produces a love for other believers. You know, we see that's evidence of truly being born from the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we can't just be on our own. And we just saw, you know, that we need the body. We need the gifts of others. And we need a place where we can exercise the gifts that God has given us. This is what it means, you know, to be a living, you know, part of Christ. And so we need the church. You know, we can't, this idea of a Christian being an island, you know, just with their own faith, no, you know, you, you are prone to so many kinds of heresies. You're prone to your own thinking. You never have your thinking about the scriptures challenged. You know, you, you, you're not hearing the word of God preached. You know, you're not in communion with others who can lift you up when you're struggling with, with doubts or with hardships of life. You know, no, you cannot do Christianity alone. You know, we need the church. You know, the church, Jesus came to establish the church, you know, as a, as a loving community. And so, you know, if you're watching this, if you're, if you're a Christian and maybe you're not part of New Life in Christ Church, but you happen to be watching this, if you believe in Christ, you know, I would strongly urge you, become part of a church. You know, this is essential to the faith. You know, there is no such thing as just Jesus and me, this American kind of Christianity. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us this. You know, he tells us in, in chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, he says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, so how do we remain in the faith? You know, elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, it warns us against drifting. You know, that we cannot do the Christian life on our own. We need the body of Christ. You know, that's part of the perseverance of our faith, that's part of it. You know, it's, you know, it's through the means that God has given, which is the church. It's one of the chief means, you know, we, you know, and we're told here not to forsake meeting together. You know, we're told specifically, don't be, you know, try to be lone ranger Christians here. You know, if we're in Christ, if we know him, we belong to his body and we need each other. 
Okay, so uh, this kind of draws us to the to the end of our lesson this week. Uh, next week we're going to finish the series of the Apostles' Creed. We're going to be looking at the forgiveness of sins, uh, the resurrection of the body, and the life ever everlasting. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for these doctrines. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. Father, we thank you for giving us of your spirit to, to open our eyes to see who Jesus is, Lord. And Father, I just pray if there are those who are struggling, Lord, with asking who is Jesus and struggling to see him, Lord, I just pray that your spirit would draw them to Jesus, would open their eyes to see him for who he really is, the exalted son of God who loves, who gave his life to save us from our sins and brings life to all who believe in him. And Lord, we just thank you for the church. We thank you for uh, that it's not just teachings that you gave us, Lord, but you gave us of your spirit and you gave us a body to which we belong, Lord, a body of fellow brothers and sisters to whom we belong, that we walk through this life together, confessing Christ together and, and living to serve one another, Lord. We thank you for the body of Christ, the church, for grafting us into that body, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you bless this, Lord, this, this word of yours, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.